Hey there, Dengar Studio. Uh, today's video, we're going to look at uh, some chart work. So this is a chart of the area we are. Um, I won't be using this specific one, but this is the style of things. So it's a classic kind of Naval C chart you see around. Um, I'm not quite sure how far we'll get today, but I'm going to sort of go through the basics of how to read a chart, I guess, and then how to um, maybe plot a few sort of bearings, compass bearings on a chart. So that's kind of what we're shooting for today. So a basic introduction to um, using a chart like this to navigate. Um, it's not a kind of common thing you, um, sorry, there's a lot of ski boats on today, so uh, maybe a few other uh, had ski boats going past, sorry. Okay, so I think this whole video is going to take place between heats of this race, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not a common thing I guess people do so much these days with GPSs, for example, um, and also just a lot of time people, you know, in smaller boats, uh, like I do, you know, you're just shooting across the river, across a lake, and there's not a lot of need for it. But I was reminded when I did some cruising sailing recently, kind of how um, how fun it can be. You know, I, I actually quite enjoy it. It's a chance to get your sort of stationary geek on. You know. Anyway, enough yucking. I'll um, I'll just grab one of the charts out now onto the table and we'll start having a look at it uh, more closely. So we use this Sydney Harbour chart for today to do this um, did this video. Um, I was actually hoping to find one of the offshore charts because it's a little bit more relevant, I think, when you're doing some sort of voyage planning sort of thing. But they're all the same. It's actually not what this video is about. It's mostly about showing you the general ways of sort of the things, important things to read off these charts. So I'll just grab the camera freehand for a little bit and I'll show you close up to some of the important things to, um, to note on the chart. So one of the really important things is just checking your chart and seeing whether the depth's in metres, feet, fathoms, whatever. Um, that's kind of, you know, a really critical thing because you need to understand what you're looking at. So that's that's kind of a very important thing. Um, up the top here also, uh, it's upside down. So where are we? Over here, for you. You'll see it's also got the chart number. Um, so each chart's pretty uniquely identified by this chart number. So when you go to order a chart, you'll see a chart of charts and you can look up the number and say, right, I want to order AUS 202, which is Sydney Harbour. Um, you can also see what um, chart datum they've used. So in this case, Latin longs from this um, GWS 984 can be plotted straight onto this chart. So if you're using a GPS to find out where you are and you want to plot it straight into a chart, um, this is sort of information that's quite important to you. Um, so yeah, depth, what area am I, what chart am I looking at? Um, um, and then a little sense, you know, like scale, um, uh, you know, information about depths in meters, heights are in meters, it'll tell you all this sort of information. So this kind of metadata about the chart is really important stuff, just to make sure that you're not swapping from one chart to another and making some assumption that turns out to, um, to actually be wrong. Now, the other big thing you'll see on a chart is a, is a compass rose on it. So there'll be several around the place for convenience. In this case, we've got one here and then one out in the middle of the water. Um, now, these compass roses show true north straight up. And the difference between true north and magnetic north is a really important sort of distinction when you're using these charts, and we'll be going through that in a bit of detail. So you'll see the compass roses, and you can take any bearing off this rose, transfer it somewhere else in the chart, and know that that's the true bearing for that, um, you know, for that particular place. Um, now the next thing you'll sort of notice is um, there's a bit of different colours. So yellow's land, um, and the depths here are depths in metres, um, and they're at a low tide. So it's basically telling you the low, other than sort of, you know, unusual atmospheric conditions or whatever, that the lowest, you'll see it here, uh, if I zoom in a little bit for you, of course zoom on this camera means move it closer, um, is 12.8 um, metres. So we know it's in metres from the top of the chart, and in that place you can expect 12.4 metres, 12.8 metres, sorry, at low tide. Sorry, more ski boats. Picked a bad day to do this, didn't I? So, when we've got this 12.8 here, you'll see this is sort of white, and white is water, um, deep water, well, and which is defined by over 10 metres here. So this particular chart goes from white to a light blue at 10 metres, and to a dark blue at 5 metres. So, if you're in the dark blue water, you're not quite shallow, medium, under 10 metres, white water, you've got at least 10 metres. Um, and where it's green, it's an area um, of the seabed that's um, actually exposed at low tide. So this has a, an 06, which is actually what they call a drying height. So that's how high above the water that patch will be on a low tide. So 
there's another chart. It's actually called a chart. It's actually got a chart number, um, but it's actually a book. And this book is kind of like the key to all these charts. So I'll actually show you that, uh, that now um, because it's got a really good diagram showing you how these drying heights and depths and bridges and things relate to each other on this chart. So this is the booklet. It's actually considered chart 5011, um, but it's a great um, sort of key to all the things you'll see in these charts. Um, and the diagram I want to show you, oh, there we go, until it's fallen open because it's been there, um, is this one. I'll get you as close up view as I can. There we go. I think that's framed. Um, and what this shows is that there's various heights that are, that are listed on a chart. And so before we talk about that green section, it was talking about a drying height. So if you've got a charted low water, then the height above low water is the height that the green sections protrude. So in this case, we had this 0.06. So at low tide, that section actually protrudes 0.6 of a metre above the water. So it's an area that does actually get exposed. Other areas, um, when there's a um, when there's a, a depth listed. So the charted depth um, here, you can see it's here, it's between the chart datum, which is uh, lowest astronomical tide. So it's saying the lowest predicted tide is the charted depth. So where we had this 12.8, we know that on a really, really low tide, i.e. lowest astronomical tide, which once again doesn't take into account things like a high pressure system and offshore breeze, all that kind of thing, but generally, you can expect it to be at least that depth below your keel. Well, below the surface of the water. And obviously, your keel depends on what sort of boat you got. Um, but you can expect to have at least that as a minimum depth. Okay. Now, they do that because it's sort of uh, you know the safest way to say they don't want to tell you how much water you've got at high tide. They want to tell you what the worst case scenario is. And so the opposite actually applies for bridges. So when you've got a bridge, not a ski boat. Hopefully, it's not going to be a loud one. Um, when you've got a bridge, what's important is knowing you've got at least so much height above it. So if you're taking a sailing boat under, what it's saying to you here is that um, at a high water, you can expect to have a minimum of a certain depth um, or a certain uh, have a bridge a certain height above the water. So at low water, you'll actually have more than listed, but you can expect a certain minimum. So it always errs on the side of caution. So you get a minimum. So heights are high water and depths are taken at low water. So while I've got it out, this book tells you every symbol pretty much used on these charts. So if you do start um, using C charts like this, uh, it's a really good one to have. Uh, another really interesting thing to have is um, lights. So I'll go through lights a bit later because it's a bit of a special thing. But the nice thing about lights on the water is they shine in a very distinct sequence. And the sequence will be on the chart. So for example, this one's um, uh, ISO R4S, uh, uh, which means it's isophase. It's equal. It's on and off as often as it's on. It's got a four second, four second flashing sequence, and it's red. And so often if you are doing a coastal voyage and you see a light, and you'll see a chart saying, oh, it should be flashing in this sequence. And you, and you see a light like that, you kind of get this really nice feeling that regardless of what your GPS is telling you, you've actually physically found what you're aiming for. And so they're, um, it's really quite good to be able to read the lights and figure out what sort of um, light it is, what are, what are its characteristics. There's a colting, isophase, constant, you know, all these sorts of things. But um, we might go into that in more detail in another video. But for now, we'll get onto the whole um, compass bearing, taking a bearing to somewhere. Okay, so now we've gone through the basic sort of, you know, what you're looking at a chart. Um, um, there's obviously loads of detail, every, even um, down to the sort of composition of the seabed's actually written on a chart, whether it's rock, sand, silt, mud, all that kind of stuff. So there's a huge amount of detail. Um, but we won't, obviously won't go right to that. Um, but we'll start uh, showing you now how to do, more ski boats, sorry, um, how to do um, just to plot a course and take a bearing off a chart. That's kind of. Uh, probably the next most useful thing. Um, and to do that, um, ideally you'll have some sort of parallel ruler. Um, these come in different styles. This style is a kind of more of a, a link scissor style. Um, you can also get ones with rollers that just sit and they'll roll evenly along. Um, depends your preference. Um, some would actually even have uh, rolls in both directions so you can move it up and down side to side and they won't change the angle they're at. 
I personally prefer this style because I, I trust it a little bit more. Rollers can stick and slip and whatever. But it's definitely personal preference. Um, and once again, it depends on the quality. A high quality roller ruler is probably very trustworthy. Um, so what the idea behind the parallel ruler is that you can take a bearing off this compass rose and then transfer it somewhere else in the chart. You can say, well, if I want to be at that angle there, then what's that angle? And I can have that angle transferred to another place in the chart. You can then hold this and then transfer it further if you need to, etc. So that's the idea behind a, a, a parallel ruler. Um, you can also use some sort of protractor. In this case, this is a, a Portland triangle. You can get a Portland square. Um, in which case you run off one of these meridians on the chart somewhere and take your angle that way. Um, sometimes it's good to use them in combination. You can use your, your parallel ruler to say, right, well, this is my bearing and then I can take an angle off that line and say, which way do I have to go, etc. So, and a compass and a pencil. They're the main bits of gear we're gonna use, um, an eraser, um, to start plotting some lines on this chart. Now, this gives us our, um, our true uh, direction, so you know, true north, east, west, whatever, and everything in between. Um, and we get our distances off the side of the chart here. So a nautical mile is uh, one minute of latitude. So here we've got uh, 33 degrees, 51 minutes, and then down here we've got 33 degrees, 52 minutes. So we know that that distance is one nautical mile, and that's same on all charts. You can't read that off the bottom of the chart here because these are, are, are lines of longitude and longitude starts, they start really close together by the equator, they're quite far apart and by the, the other pole, they're quite close together again. So longitudes varies with latitude, whereas latitude, they're parallel lines, they're parallel all the way around the world. So you can always count on one uh, minute of latitude being one nautical mile which is uh, 1,852 kilometer, uh, kilometers, uh, meters. So I'll bring you in close here for a second. And what you'll see here is a uh, magnetic variation for this region. So this varies around the world and it actually changes over time as well. And so what this is saying is that um, you've got uh, 12 degrees 40 minutes east in 2004 and that's the magnetic variation for Sydney Harbour and what that says is that if your compass shows true north or shows north magnetic north it's actually going to be 12 degrees 40 true so what that means is that um, the compass doesn't show true north so you need to take account of that when you plot things onto a chart now Sometimes that error is east, which means it's clockwise round. Sometimes it's west. Um, so the sort of the, the, the thing you remember is when the error is east, the compass reads least. And when the error is west, the compass reads best. Okay, now this is true about the, you know, the compass reads least in most cases. So for example, if my compass is reading 30 degrees, it's actually 42 degrees true, because the compass reads 12 degrees less or least. In the season. But of course, if I'm here, true is 10 and my compass is reading uh, 358, the number's greater, but always think of it as least. It's heading counterclockwise as opposed to clockwise. Takes a little while to get your head around that, but you'll see, we'll see a few examples and it'll be a bit clearer. So I'll put this camera back on the stand and we'll start plotting some bearings. Now, I don't want to sort of bombard you too much, but I will just introduce one other thing that you'll see um, if you start studying this or whatever, and that's that there's uh, true magnetic variation and deviation. And I'll show you some deviation cards. This is from the Dick Gandy's uh, Boating Manual, Australian Boating Manual. Really good book. Um, it's generally the book you use if you go and do your coxswains or something. It's certainly the textbook when I had when I was at TAFE doing that. Um, and what you'll have is these deviation charts. And what they say is for a particular vessel, there can be compass error as well. So you've actually got to take um, the magnetic variation for the part of the world you're in into account and the deviation for the vessel you're in. So what it says is the compass built into the boat will be affected by the boats, you know, the metal in the boat, anything emitting um, electromagnetic radiation. And so in this case, they're saying, if you're heading 160, then the vessel will also introduce an error of eight degrees west. 
So I would have to um, get to the point where the compass is showing less 12 degrees 4 a.m. than it's adding 8 degrees for being west. So it's uh, um, it sort of becomes a compound thing. But I'm not going to go into deviation. So for this exercise, we're going to presume a vessel that doesn't introduce any um, deviation into the compass readings. But just be aware that there is this extra kind of layer to the calculation if you're um, if you're doing it um, for an exam or, or sort of commercially or whatever. Um, and then what you'll see here is, oops, sorry, bumping that, um, that you go from true. Um, your variation gives you your magnetic, then you add your deviation, get your compass. So to get from compass to true, you're passing through the original compass reading, add the deviation for the uh, vessel, it gives you your magnetic reading, add the variation for the area you're in, and it gives you your true reading. It's, it's not too hard, and it's saying for easterly you're minus, um, and you know, heading down this way, and easterly you're plus when you're heading up that way, depending whether you're going from compass to true or true to compass. So that really is the, you know, the um, the heart of how you do it, but we're just going to simply do uh, compass variation and true to start with. All right, so I probably right royally confused you all now, but let's start doing some examples. I'm sure it'll get a bit clearer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I'm floating around um, here in the what they call the West Channel of Sydney Harbour, which is um, uh, oh, here we go. Um, this is actually the western side of Sydney. Sydney Harbour actually extends further to the east. Um, and here's Bradley's Head. So Bradley's Head is one of the main um, sort of marks in the harbour. Um, there's a, the mast of one of the old naval ships there. There's also a safe water mark here. And this is actually used as a bit of a, um, a bit of a sort of a roundabout as such, like a silent cop to stop people cutting the corner. So um, ships will come in this side and then head out round so you can't sort of cut this corner, you're supposed to go around here. Um, and once again this is an isophase light in two seconds and the markings are red and white stripes. We always call them the Kentucky Fried Chicken markers because they've got those sort of colours. Um, okay, so I know I'm somewhere in this area and I might then take a bearing to the light at Robson's Point. So what I'm going to do is I get my compass out on the boat and I say, right, I can take a bearing to Robinson's point and it is, um, let's call it uh, 50 degrees. So I'll do the working, actually I'll go grab a piece of paper, back, sorry. So I'm going to say I've got my compass reading, then I've got my variation and a true reading. Now normally I would have that deviation in between there again, but let's, let's not overcomplicate it. So I got my compass out, let's make it more realistic. It was 53. And I took a bearing of 53 degrees from me to the light here at Robinson's Point. And then I know my variation is, uh, let's call it 12 degrees. It's actually probably close to 13, isn't it, anyway. Um, and I then say, right, oh, and also it's good when you write these, um, these bearings sometimes to sort of say, Put a little C so you know you don't get, ever get confused and say, oh, was that a true bearing or a, or a compass bearing? So in this case, I've got 53 degrees compass. Now, with the variation, it's at 20, it's 12 degrees east. And we had the rule that when the error is east, the compass reads least. So what that means is the bearing I just took on my compass is really 65 degrees true. Okay. If it was west, we'd know that it was the other way. There would actually have been 41 degrees true. So it's just saying, I took a compass bearing, I know from the chart here that the error is 12 degrees east, I know the compass reads least, so we know we've taken 65. Okay, so now I go to 65, and then I can go to my, um, the compass rows on the chart, and I've got 65 here, I hope it's got this close enough for you to see. And so if I put through the center of the rows, then to 65, I know that's the bearing I'm on. Then I can take this ruler, transfer it out to the light that I took my bearing to, draw a line, and I know that I'm somewhere along this line. Because I took my compass bearing, I convert it to a true, 
and I was aiming for this point. So I know my vessel's somewhere along this line. Now I could take another bearing and I could say, right, um, let's have a look. Uh, say for example, something quite distinctive. I might say, um, I could see the, the tip of, of Garden Island, which is the naval base here in Sydney Harbour. And that particular one I had at, um, say 150 degrees. So once again, I took another bearing there of 150 degrees compass. My variations same for this whole chart. It doesn't change enough to warrant where on the chart we are. So I know that's actually 160 degrees, 162 degrees true. So now we come down here again. We find 162 is here so rule is going through the center of the rows and crossing 162 then we just bring this out till the tip of garden on whatever we were taking our bearing across and we can draw a line and we can know that's where we are so that's just taking a couple of bearings um, um, to two places to give you a you know a really good um, good fix on where you are in the water um, these things, obviously, accuracy sort of varies with the, the, the site on the compass, how much it's rocking, whatever. Um, but the two bearing method, taking into account your um, your compass reading, your variation of true, will get you pretty much in the ballpark. Now, another technique that works um, pretty well is, um, well, actually, very well, is is taking transits. Now. I might be traveling along this particular course and I'm trying to find a particular point and you'll see landmarks moving and so if I come along here and say right um, as I'm traveling this way the exact moment I can see Darling Point come out from behind Garden Island I know I'm somewhere on that line and that sort of thing's very, very accurate. You know, you can just be watching, and the moment you see this, you go, right, I know I'm somewhere on that line. Um, once again, you need a second point, um, maybe a compass bearing or whatever, but you know, this, this line's very accurate, and your compass reading is gonna be, you know, as accurate as you can get it anyway. Um, it's much harder to take a transit between two points if you're kind of looking left and right and saying, right, when I'm on, that line when I see that I'm between both of these. It's not impossible, but you're never going to get the sort of pinpoint accuracy you get when you're looking across the two points in the same direction. So just bear in mind if you need to, if there's no distinctive points, you know, you may need to do this, but just bear in mind that it's very much just kind of, you know, a bit of a judgment thing and you're going to be out by a certain amount. Whereas having these two transits on the same are very accurate. Often with shipping, you'll actually see there's two arrows on a shore, like big signs, you know, a couple of meters tall, and they'll be a, you know, a, a, an arrow pointing up, an arrow pointing down. And when those two arrows are in line, you know you're in a shipping channel that's quite deep water. So even big ships use this sort of transit method for getting, um, getting themselves lined up in a channel. So we talked about distance briefly before, and we talked about how up the up the um, on the you know the north south axis, we have a single degree. Uh, sorry, a single minute of latitude is a nautical mile. And you'll see that's actually divided into 10 as well, which are called cables. So a cable's a tenth of a nautical mile. So here we've got, say, uh, one, two, three, four, five. So if I come here and just get this compass to do oh, accurately. And so if I'm at this point, I can say, right, say for example I was on that transit and then I can say there, yep, it's half a nautical mile from where I am to the point of Garden Island or whatever. So it's nice and easy just to take, or conversely you can go, right, how far is it here to uh, Robertson's point? Just measure it off, come anywhere here to one of these uh, minute lines and there I know that it's one, two, three, three and a bit. So it's just over a third of a nautical mile, that distance. So get all your distance from this, uh, from your uh, minutes of latitude and 
use, a, use your compass to transfer those distances onto the chart. So to finish up for today, I'm going to go through a full, I think, just, just go through one full um, uh, compass to true translation um, using a deviation chart, just so that um, so you can see that. Um, hopefully it made sense, um, the ones I've shown so far. So if, if it did and you want to sort of see the sort of full catastrophe, then I'll, I'll show you that now. Uh, there's heaps more you can do. Actually, stuff sort of starts to get a little bit more interesting, I think, with charts. Um, when you start looking at things like uh, plotting an intercept course or adding your um, the currents and the drift to see where you'll actually end up. Um, so, But I'm going to do that in a bit of a later video. I'll consider this video sort of more the basics of, of using a C chart. Uh, and I think to sort of for the sake of completeness, it's best if we do a, one full example before we finish up. So the way it's um, that I was taught anyway is uh, true virgins make dull companions. So it's true, variation, magnetic, deviation, and then compass. And then obviously you can work forwards or backwards. So once again, I'm going to say I'm, in this case I'll work, before we worked from um, saying if we had a, uh, a compass reading, um, and I wanted to find out what it was true. In this case, I'm going to take the example where I know I want to head in a particular direction. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say here, I'm, uh, what's an example? Here we go, start at the Opera House, then a long point, and I want to get to Robertson's point, or actually let's even put a little line there. So let's say to Bradley's head. So I'm at the Opera House, I'm heading to Bradley's head. So this, is the one the way I want to go. Now I draw that line, and then I'm going to transfer that line down to the compass row. So when my parallel ruler gets through the um, center of the compass rows, I read it off here, and it's 85. So I can mark on that, and something I should have done before probably, is you can mark those bearings. So that's 85 true, that line. This line I might have actually marked as a compass bearing because I took it as a reading on the water. But what I've got here is my true section, and I'm saying it's 85. Now, my variation is 12 degrees east, and I know that my compass always reads least. So if I was to put that on a compass, it would be 73 degrees. So that's, ah, sorry, so that's the magnetic, um, not my compass, it's actually the, the true sort of magnetic uh, bearing I would take if I didn't have any deviation. But we're going to go on and do devi deviation on the boat this time. So, with a deviation chart, I then find the nearest magnetic, because it varies. It, the deviation is not consistent, whereas the variation was consistent. It's 12 degrees east everywhere. In this case, the deviation varies um, based on what direction I'm going. So in this case, I'm going... Uh, 73, and it gives me a, a 60 and an 80. So 60 is um, 4 degrees east, and 80 is 2 degrees east. So what I'm going to do is say roughly it's in between. So I'm actually going to take it as 3 and sort of interpolate slightly. So I'm going to say that my deviation is 3 degrees east. So 3 degrees east, compass reads least. So in this case, 70. So what's that saying is in this harbour, on the particular boat I'm on, heading in that bearing, um, in order to travel this 85 true, I need to actually travel 70 on my compass. So that's how you work the whole thing. We've sort of just been doing true to compass by using variation, but on some boats, you will also have this deviation. It depends a lot on the boat. Some boats have, you know, the compasses are perfectly tuned. It might even be like a gyro compass that doesn't have deviation at all. Um, but it might be a boat with very little ferrous metal in it um, and you won't actually have deviation at all. Generally, if a compass is well tuned, deviation is quite small. It's in the half degree mark as well. So something just to, just to be aware of anyway. But that is the full exercise you'll be required to do if you were sitting an exam for doing 
coastal navigation. So I think we'll leave it there for today. Um, I think we've gone through sort of the basics of a chart, you know, looking at um, uh, how you measure your depths, you know, when you're looking at um, litres and feet, so we're making sure you're looking at the chart and know what units this in is very important, um, knowing your heights under a bridge. Um, then also just looking at taking a magnetic bearing, you would actually take with a compass, so your magnetic bearing is when you literally just hold your compass and look and see what it reads, and how you translate that to a true bearing that you can plot onto a chart. Uh, how you can measure your distances down the side. Uh, so I think that sort of covers the real, real basics of, of reading a chart. Um, it's not a common thing people do so much these days, as I was saying, so I kind of think it's fun just to, you know, sort of just out of interest, even if you never intend to use the knowledge as such. But if you are studying for your, like a Coxon's exam or one of your master's tickets, it's definitely something you're going to need to know well to pass those exams. Um, so next time I think we'll look a bit more at maybe sort of doing some coastal voyage plotting, so doing uh, sort of set and drift and, and sort of planning a voyage rather than just saying, right, I'm here now, saying, right, I'm going to go this way, what are my turn points going to be, etc. cetera, and waypoints. So I'll, I'll do that in a later video. Um, we also went over a few of the symbols, but it's not really something you want to learn from a video. Um, getting a book like the, the 5011 chart will just show you them all and you can scan through them look for the ones that are relevant to you. Um, but having said that, I will go through um, lights and navigation marks down the track, I think. Uh, having said that, it'd be great to hear from you guys and know whether um, this sort of thing is something you're interested in seeing or whether I should just stick more to the sort of practical on water mechanical videos or whatever. So, um, you know, let me know what interests you if you want to see more of this sort of thing or not. Um, anyway, so thanks for watching. Uh, please subscribe if you do want to see more of these sorts of videos and I'll catch you soon. See ya.